All right, hey guys, so uh, want to welcome you here. You are um, watching us streaming from the uh, campus here for Cedar Ridge Christian Church, uh, and we are in uh, located in Sepulpa. Uh, that's where our campus is located anyway. So hey, we're glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are, uh, as always, we're presenting the gospel in ways I think that are relevant and meaningful, and I pray and hope that you'll you'll be so encouraged by what that what I get to share with you today, uh, that you'll not only like the message internally, but you'll like it on Facebook and then share it uh, in the stream. Now, here's my deal. I need to get to the, through this material both quickly and meaningfully. So in order to do that, I'm going to stay right on topic and we're going to move right through it. Here's what's going to happen today. I'm going to share a message with you from God's Word. We're going to share a moment of communion together. So if you have a bit of grape juice or wine or and, and some bread on hand, go ahead and, and collect those things. We'll be uh, participating in the Lord's Supper together in just a few moments when the lesson's done. And then after that, I have a very special announcement for those who are attending the Sepulpa campus uh, that have to do with the future of our campus and, uh, and gaining some clarity and direction for where we're going from here. So please stay tuned. Um, let's rock and roll. We're going to get right into this and go into the Gospel of John. We're talking this week from John chapter 12, Jesus is King. Jesus is King. Now, of course, this is something I know, something that you know, and that you have believed alongside me for probably years now. But in this series, we're talking about the Gospel of John that you may believe and that by believing, You'll have life in his name. See, this is the key to remember that Jesus didn't come just to give us facts to believe. He came to give us a life to live. And that's where we're headed. In John chapter 10, Jesus has very pointed conversation with the Pharisees. Kind of gets up in their face to let them know in no uncertain terms that he is exclusive and that he is the one way to, to, the, to the Father, the one way to the kingdom. There is no other way. Anybody who says otherwise, he says, is a, a thief and a robber and comes to steal and kill and destroy. These words are pointed right at the Pharisees in this context. In chapter 11, he proves his deity once again by raising Lazarus from the dead. He's already proven his Messiah to the, uh, through the rabbinic tradition who said, well, then when the Messiah comes, we're gonna have, he's going to be uh, able to give sight to the blind. Well, in John chapter 9, Jesus heals a man who was born blind, proving once again he is the Messiah. So in word and in deed, Jesus claims that he is the Son of God, he is the Messiah, and that those who believe in him will have life. Well, we're at, uh, we finished up in chapter 11 last week, but I want to go back real quick to show you something at the end of chapter 11. This is the context it's going to set up for chapter 12. Verse 54 of chapter 11, it says, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea, but instead he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. Now, I want you to understand what's going on here. Jesus, I believe, knows that he is nearing the end of his mortal life, and he is spending his last days on earth as a mortal human being with the people that he loves. In fact, he's doing something that probably... If, if we knew our time, uh, we would probably do the same. We would go out, we would spend a, a quiet time with the people that we love in a quiet place. And that's exactly what Jesus goes to do. Now, six days, however, before his final Passover, Jesus comes to a place called Bethany. We've been here before. This is the home of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And these are people that are very dear to him. Again, I think this is why he's spending time with them because his days here on earth as a mortal are numbered and, and he is spending time with the people he loves. So he comes to Bethany near Jerusalem. Now, while he's here, his, uh, you, you gotta understand this too, Jesus' popularity and infamy both are on the increase. I mean, he's growing with credibility, in credibility with the people and in infamy among the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders but he is becoming very, very popular. People know who Jesus is, they know what he's doing, and they're talking about it. And the crowd of people, the masses of people who are seeing these things is growing. But Jesus has spent some private time out in the wilderness 
the village called Ephraim with his disciples. He comes to Bethany, still relatively traveling in secret, but look what happens. Chapter uh, 12, verse 9, it says, A large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there, and they came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. Now, this is a big deal. Lazarus has now become a huge part of this story, and, and I'm going to show you in a moment why I think what happens with Lazarus is actually prophetic. But this is the context. Jesus now coming into Jerusalem in the famous triumphal entry, and we're going to unpack that today as we show that Jesus is king. Now, what we're going to see is that there are three distinct reactions to the lordship of Jesus Christ, three distinct reactions given to us right here in chapter 12, and they represent right along the theme of the gospel of John, the, this kind of dichotomy of faith that John has shown throughout his entire gospel. There are people who believe and people who don't, people who see and people who don't, and there's people in the middle who are still trying to figure out what they see and what they don't see. And this is exactly a representation of the three reactions that we see to Jesus' Lordship right here in John chapter 12. And they are these three. You have plotters, you have pretenders, and you have praisers. And we're gonna talk about those three groups in that order, plotters, pretenders, and praisers. Let's take the first group first, plotters. Who are the plotters? Well, the plotters, simply put, are those who are at this point actually working to create a scenario in which Jesus and even Lazarus at this point can be arrested and put to death. They want Jesus ended. It's not enough to say they don't want anything to do with him because they're not willing to ignore him anymore. They're not willing to just wait for an occasion. They are now creating a scenario where they can end Lazarus and end Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you, I think the plot against Nazareth is prophetic uh, to our own lives as Christians. Let me show you what I mean in verse 10 and 11. It says, The chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus, as well as well as Jesus for and here's why on account of him many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing him and here's what I'm going to tell you today there are still people who are plotting against Jesus and the more you are a person who who other people are believing on account of you if people see your light shining they they hear your witness they see you living out your faith in Jesus the more you do that, the brighter you shine, the more of a target you're going to be. Hey, guess what? Martha and Mary are believers too, but Lazarus, risen from the dead, is a living testimony to the power and the identity of Jesus Christ. And you know what? The world doesn't like it. The plotters don't like it. And so they are making plans to kill Lazarus. See that? It making plans not just kind of waiting to see if he might die or, or anything like that. They are creating a scenario where this is going to happen. And you know what? The more you put your faith in Jesus and let your light shine, the more people are going to plot to get you out of their lives. Um, and it, it is going to happen. It will happen. We'll talk about that in a moment. John chapter 12 and verse 19 is, is this moment after Jesus' entrance into the kingdom and the plotters continue. They have seen the crowds by the side of the road hailing Jesus as king. Here's their response. The Pharisees said to one another, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. You can hear people today, you can hear agnostics and atheists alike saying, oh my goodness, we can't believe this seems so foolish that the whole world is going after religion. The whole world is going after Jesus. And many of them have gone beyond simply ignoring our faith and have gone into direct combat mode. Uh, they literally want to end your faith. And in some cases around the world, they will end your life if they find out that you're a Christian. Hey, this is very real. And I believe uh, coming more and more our way, even here in America, some people in our world have no use for Jesus and actually have made themselves enemies. Here's what Paul said in Philippians 3. 
For I've often told you before and tell you again, even with tears, that there are many that live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Now listen to how he defines them. He says their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. Can we give you an example of this? Their glory is in their shame. Their glory is in their shame. You, I, I think I can see this more in the world today than ever before. People who are actually proud of their, of their disgraceful, uh, rebellious, self-indulging behavior. I see it all around. Literally, I was scrolling through Facebook the other day as I'm often tempted to do, and I saw a picture, a, woman, a meme of a woman who was advocating abortion. Now hear this, she wasn't just advocating abortion, she wasn't just standing on a corner shouting for women's rights. She wasn't just, you know, uh, shouting a pro-choice stance. She was literally wearing a t-shirt and on this t-shirt it said in lar white t-shirt, large black letters, it said, I've had 21 abortions. And she is literally trying to receive glory from this shameful behavior. I mean, can you imagine the kind of life somebody has to live to, to not just have had to have or had 21 abortions, but the, what, what's going on here? How is this okay? How is this not shameful on some level? Even if it's not her own shame, I don't know, maybe she was raped 21 times. I don't know, That's, raping someone also shameful. My point is this, there are people in this world who literally glory and brag about their sinful exploits. Whether it's abortion, whether it's how much they drink, or how many people they've been with, or how much they've been able to uh, do one over on somebody, uh, or they've been able to whip somebody, or beat someone, or whatever, you, you name it. More and more today, I see people taking glory in their shame. And here's the truth. It's because their minds are set on earthly things. They are out for their own agenda. They have no use for God and they will eventually, if not already, plot to remove him from their life. Now there's a second group of people that I want to talk about now and that is the pretenders. There's really only one kind of pretender, but there's two categories. And here's what I mean by that. A pretender is somebody basically who pretends to be something they're not, right? Well, you have two categories of this. You have, first of all, uh, one kind of pretender represented here by Judas. Let me read a bit about Judas here in chapter 12, and you're going to see what I mean. It says, John chapter 12, verse 5 and 6. Um, but let me set up the context. Jesus is in Bethany. This is before the triumphal entry, but Jesus is in Bethany. He's at Mary and Martha's house. Mary has just bowed at the feet of Jesus, anointed his feet with some expensive perfume, and Judas responds this way. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. But verse 6 says he didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as a keeper of the money bag, he would help himself to what was put in it. Now, here's my point. Judas was a follower. In other words, he literally would follow Jesus around, physically would follow Jesus around. But he, would not, he didn't follow Jesus' character. He followed Jesus' person for what he could get out of it. Now, let me tell you, this challenge isn't just for people who would literally betray Jesus to the cross for money. This is, this is true of a lot of us, and, and even some of us who, who are Christian, we battle within our own selves to fight against this idea that we are churchgoers, we're, we're attending physically because of what we gain from being church following people we get pats on the back do we get praise do we get is that where we get our social fulfillment is because we're following Jesus now don't get me wrong some of there's nothing wrong with silver there's nothing wrong with having 30 pieces of silver there's nothing wrong with pats on the back there's nothing wrong with people congratulating you on a job well done but my point is if this is our end game if we are in it for what we get out then we're in it for the wrong reasons you know, it's the same attitude that creeps into our minds when we say, I don't know if I want to go to church. I don't know if I'm getting anything out of it. What am I getting out of it? Hey, guess what? 
That's what Judas used to do. He used to help himself to what was put in so that he could get something out of it. Now, that's not to say Judas didn't benefit from the the charitable donations of the ministry. That's not to say that we don't benefit socially from being part of the church. It is to say simply this. May we never be pretenders, only faking our faith in Jesus because of what we get out of being around Jesus' people. I hope that's not us. There's another kind of pretender that's represented in verse 42. You're going to recognize this one right away and understand the challenge right away. At the same time, many among the leaders believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they wouldn't openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue because they loved human praise more than praise from God. What You see the pretending going on here? They're pretending not to be believers, even though they do, and, and they're doing it because they're afraid. Now, here's the truth. I think some of us probably spend some time here. Uh, there's a challenge to us, right? What happens in our world today more than ever? More than ever, what happens in our world when you start openly acknowledging Jesus? When you start openly, not just proclaiming that he was a person who lived, a historical figure, but you're saying, yeah, you know what? Jesus lived and died and rose again. He's still alive and he lives in me. He's the king of my life. I live empowered by his spirit. I worship him. He's my Lord, my savior, my king, my friend. You start saying this kind of stuff in public today and uh, what do an experiment. Try it and see what are the different reactions you get. Hopefully you're already getting those reactions. These are the pretenders. These are their reactions. But I want to get to the third category. And this is the category, hopefully, that you watching this, I'm hoping, praying, I, delivering this message, belong in this category of people. I'm going to tell you the truth. I have lived at times in my life in the other two categories. I think all of us probably can say the same. But Jesus goes on to teach two truths to those who would be willing to praise him. And they're taught right here in John chapter 12. Keep in mind the context. Jesus is about to be glorified. Glorified, to, when we talk about Jesus being glorified, we're talking about his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension once again to the right hand of God. He is about to be glorified. He is about to be vindicated. He is about to be brought back from the grave to prove once and for all and for all eternity that he is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Believe it and have life in his name. I mean, this is what, this is the whole point of his traveling here. And he is about to be glorified. And he teaches two things in this chapter that tie us into his glory. In other words, we are glorified in him. And he's going to bring to light two things uh, that are essential to our faith as Christians. In fact, I would tell you, you almost can't be a Christian and not believe these things. Here is truth number one. You must die to live. You must die to live. Here's what Jesus said. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, and very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now this is about to happen. Jesus is about to die a kernel of wheat, and in dying, he's going to produce many seeds. In fact, later on, Jesus is going to say something to this effect. Hey guys, you know what? I have to leave you and I have to go, but it's for your good. He says, it's actually a good thing that I'm going because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. We're going to see that as we study into John chapter 14. But it's so essential that Jesus, we see Jesus as the kernel of wheat that falls to the ground and dies, only a single seed, but in dying producing many seeds. We share in his glory because of him giving up his life for us. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 25, anyone who loves their life will lose it. I think nobody loved life more than Jesus. I think Jesus loved his own life so much so that he knew that the only way to keep it was to give it up. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. And anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for all eternity, for eternal life. 
Let's talk about this word hate real quick because I want to make it clear. We use the word hate in English today and we often think of, I hate you, like with anger and wrath. And while there is a certain element of, of wrath where God's judgment is concerned, that's not what Jesus is, is talking about here. It's not being angry with yourself so much as it is the idea of the Greek word is miseo, and the word literally means to put away as either irrelevant, distasteful, or undesirable. So it means to turn something out, to, to put it away. And so that's what he's saying here. You gotta hate your life in this world. You gotta be able to put it aside as not something worth keeping, not something, it, it's, it's an untasteful thing. It's an irrelevant thing. It's a thing to be disregarded and rejected as, as of ultimate and eternal value. And so he's saying, yeah, you gotta let go of your life in this world if you wanna keep it for all eternity. And then he says this in verse 26, whoever serves me must follow me. In other words, I'm the colonel fallen to the ground to die. You wanna serve me, then you follow me. You do the same as I do. And if you do, he says, then where I am, my servant will be because my father will honor the one who serves me. Guys, Jesus is teaching hardcore delayed gratification. You understand, right, that Jesus gave his life for us, not just his death, not just these moments on the cross, not just Passion Week, but his whole life from manger to the moment that he gave up his spirit is given for us. Talk about delayed gratification. 33 years Jesus gave of himself so that he could have his life back for eternity. And he says, anyone, anyone, look at this, verse 20, uh, the next verse, I'm sorry, what was it, verse 25, anyone who loves their life like me will lose it. I want you to imagine a sunflower seed for a moment. Can you imagine inside the little, a little tiny sunflower seed is all the DNA and the programming for a sunflower? And the sunflower, of course, produces many seeds. From one seed, many seeds. And all of the programming for that is inside the, the DNA of that tiny seed. Can you, I mean, seeds don't have brains, right? So can you imagine? No more than a seed can comprehend that it has the potential to become a flower. It has no idea what a flower is, it only knows itself as a seed. It has hope that it could be something more, but what that is is only a dream. It's only, it can only be imagined. Listen to what Paul says here, 1 Corinthians 15. He says, this is what it'll be like with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown, perishable, but raised imperishable. Can you imagine living in a body that would, that would just never perish? never get old, never dwindle away. It is sown in dishonor, but raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but raised a spiritual one. And if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual one. Man, I, think, I don't think a sunflower seed can any more comprehend a sunflower than we can comprehend everything that we're going to be. But here's what we do know. It's worth it. Look at what Paul says in Romans 8, 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed in us. Not even worth comparing. Not even worth comparing. I mean, how cool is that? And that's what's happening here. It's what Jesus is saying is about to happen, that he who was the light of the world is going to die. He's going to ascend, uh, raise from the dead. He's going to ascend from, uh, to heaven. And from there, he's going to send the Spirit to dwell in our hearts. And he who was the light of the world, as one man, one seed, is now going to be the light of the world, many seeds. Jesus was the light of the world. And we, Paul describes it this way. He says, you shine like stars in the universe. Jesus himself in Matthew 5 says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hill that you can't hide. Like a, a light that you put in, in, in your house and you put it on a lampstand. You don't cover it up with a bowl. You put it on a lampstand because it gives light to everyone. So truth number one, if you want to live, you have to die. You know, Scripture says that it is appointed once unto everyone that they should die one time. 
And I don't know about you, Christian friend, but I've already done it. And I think you probably have too. If you gave your life to Jesus, if you died to yourself, if you've been baptized into Christ, that's what Paul describes in Romans chapter 6. He says those of us who were baptized in Christ have been buried with him. So guess what? I'm dead to sin, I'm dead to myself, and I'm alive to Jesus. I died once, now death has no hold on me or on you, believer, or on anyone else in this world who has ever put their faith in Jesus. Death has nothing on us. We're already done with it. We already died once when we died to self and came alive to Jesus. Here's truth number two. To see the light is to be the light. See the light, be the light. Jesus said it this way. You're going to have the light just a while longer, so walk while you have it before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in dark doesn't know where they're going. So believe in the light while you have it so that you may become children of light. And this is all the things that I've been telling, telling you. If you look to Jesus to be the light of your life, then you become light in life. I'm going to say that again. If you look to Jesus to be the light of your life, then you become a light in life as well. You're a children of light. That means you shine. His glory is your glory. We glory in. In fact, we have no other glory except the glory that we have in Jesus. And that brings me to my final point I want to share with you today. And that is to talk about the praisers. Let's show who they are right here in chapter 12. So we've looked at the, the plotters, we've looked at the pretenders, who are the praisers? The, the, the praisers are the ones obviously who recognize Jesus is king and we're here. We're here to worship, we're here to praise, we're here to follow our king, we're here to recognize who he is. That's what we do. And so we have a couple of examples of it I just wanna share with you. First of all, you have the crowd of people, right? I wanna share this one first, even though it's not chronologically right, but you have this crowd of people in verse 13 saying, Hosanna, which means savior. And they're declaring Jesus as their savior. It was a term of praise. Salvation is what they're saying. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Amen and amen. Blessed is Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord, who comes in the power of God. Blessed is Jesus, the King of Israel, and not just the King of the DNA, children of Abraham, but the King of the children of Abraham who are children by faith, which is all of us. Hosanna, Savior, salvation. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. That's us. And here's us. I want to go all the way back to the beginning of the chapter, verse 3. Before the triumphal entry, before anyone else fell to the ground, before anyone else waved a palm branch, before the Hosannas, before the king of Israel, son of David, Mary took a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume and she poured it on Jesus' feet and she wiped it with her hair. You know, there's a passage of scripture that says that a woman's hair is her glory. A woman's hair is her glory. Now, I, I, I know that that's metaphoric and I know it's kind of symbolic, but I gotta tell you, I've seen grown women with long hair get a haircut and then weep for days about it. I don't understand it because I'm not a girl. I don't understand it for whatever reason, okay? But this woman is, from what scripture says, taking her glory and putting it at the feet of Jesus to wipe his feet with her hair. She would clean his feet, this most meaningful servant-driven task, and she would do that with her glory. And guess what? The house is filled with the fragrance. I love it. Not of the perfume. Hear this. It doesn't say the house is filled with the fragrance of her perfume, although I think that's physically what it was. But spiritually, what we're talking about here is this. The house is filled with the fragrance of her gift. The house is filled with the fragrance of her gift. Here's what I'm going to finish with. This is my challenge for you. May the world and may the church be filled with the fragrance of our gift to the king. Our very lives laid down for the kingdom. That we too, like Jesus, one kernel 
lay life down so that others can see. Like Lazarus, many came to believe on account of him. May many come to believe on account of you and on account of me. May the world be filled with the fragrance of our gift to the King. Let's pray. God, we take a moment to worship you, to praise you, to honor you as God. Thank you for how you love us and, and it, it never ends. Thank you for that gift. I pray that you would keep us challenged and inspired and empowered to be light in this world. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to take a moment to go through a uh, communion liturgy. Thank you for hanging on this long. Um, I just want to encourage you to, uh, if you've got your, your wine or grape juice and if you've got your bread, um, we're going to go through this communion liturgy together. Of course, you can always pause the video, gather the things, and then come back. We're going to read just scripture today and uh, share in communion together in a very simple way, but also a very meaningful one. And I think, um, oh, I've got to open up a new packet here. Um, I think this will be a blessing to you as we share these scriptures together, okay? Um, so we're going to start in the Psalms. Start with a prayer and then in the Psalm. Lord, we accept your invitation to join you today as we gather around the table that you've prepared for us. Today, as always, this table serves as a reminder of your grace for us, abundant and never-ending. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts of your presence, your love, and your unfailing mercy, and we offer thanks in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, soul, and all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed, and he made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel, for the Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse or harbor his anger forever. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him as far as the east is from the west. So far. This is how far. He's removed our transgressions from us. Like a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And it's because he knows how we're formed and he remembers that we are but dust. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your gifts offered for us on and through the cross of your suffering. For on that cross, you gave us your sinless and mortal body to die so that through your death and suffering, we might have the forgiveness of our sins. We also thank you for the blood that was shed for us on the cross, for in the shedding of your blood you offered a covenant of eternal life. So, Lord, we offer thanksgiving and gratitude for your body, for your blood, for forgiveness, and for the life that we have in your name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup, this cup, is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen, and thank you, Lord, for the salvation we have in your name. From Revelation, it says, Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me, and I'll give to each person according to what they have done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Hey, thank you for sharing the table with me today. And of course, as always, we want to invite you to join us every Sunday at 1030, whether in person or online, to share in this time at the table, to share in a message from God's Word. Uh, we want you to be encouraged. We want you to be filled with the spiritual food that Jesus gives us each and every day. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hang on. If you're a Sepulpa member, I have a special announcement 
uh, just for you, and it's this. In the coming weeks, our elders have challenged us to pray uh, for the future of our campus, and so I'm going to keep that challenge on the table. I also want to kind of put a kibosh on any potential rumors that may be going around that our elders or the leadership or that our campus has already determined what we're going to do. Uh, and the truth is, no, we haven't. We really have not. Um, our elders have been very adamant with me, um, and, and I'm also in a group full agreement that before we can decide where we're going to move, we want to get the Lord's blessing and direction. And not even in that order. We want to get his direction and then his blessing. So in the next few Sundays, not this coming Sunday, but the next, we're going to gather um, for an in-person meeting on the campus, 406 West Teal, right here at our campus. Uh, we'll Zoom people in who, who are not able to be physically at the campus. But we want you to be present, whether online or in person, so we can pray and share. And that's what we want to do. We want to pray together, and I want to challenge you to keep praying. Journal your prayers. Write down what God is sharing with you in your prayer time, in your scripture reading, through the nudges and thoughts that you get from the Holy Spirit through the course of the week. And, and bring those and simply share them. We're not going to take time initially to debate uh, the options or what our favorites might be. Right now, we're just putting these options in front of us because here's what I believe. With those options, the different ideas in front of us, we know how to pray. And, and as we pray, God will make clear to us all, I believe, in consensus, what he wants us to do together to move forward as a campus and as a church. So thank you for joining in that. Thank you for being humble. Thank you for being patient. Um, thank you for uh, putting this in front of yourself. Uh, I want you really praying, too, not just about the campus, but about your own life and your own family and what, what it is, where it is that God may be leading you and your family and how that might look in the context of our community and our campus um, and just really seek his will, seek his best for you and for your family and for your church family. So thanks again for listening. Hey, I'm going to tell you what. I love all you guys, and I'm so grateful to all of you for jumping in and listening today. I hope I get to see you next week. Have a great week.